But tonight we have a special guest joining us. His name is Jack Posovic, and he hails from Washington, D.C. You may know him on Twitter. Uh, he's got a terrific account on Twitter. And so, Jack, how are you doing tonight? I'm, I'm doing great, Kelly. I really appreciate you guys reaching out to me and having me on. And I just got to say MAGA all the way. All, the, All way. Is- the way. Speaking of MAGA, before we get started in the show, we've got a new Trump video uh, that Bill wants to show. So how about we go right into that and let's take a look at this video from the Trump campaign. Former President Bill Thank Clinton you, described Obamacare as, quote, the craziest thing in the world. <laughs> but the people that are getting killed in this deal are small business people and individuals who make just a little too much to get any of these subsidies. So you've got this crazy system where all of a sudden 25 million more people have health care, and then the people are out there busting it sometimes 60 hours a week, wind up with their premiums doubled and their coverage cut in half. I want to defend the Affordable Care Act. It is one of the great accomplishments, not only of this president, but of the Democratic Party going back to Harry Truman. It doesn't make any sense. The insurance model doesn't work here. It's not like life insurance. It's not like casualty. It's not like predicting flood. It it doesn't work. Wow. Wow. When you lose Bill Clinton, you can (laughs) safely say that Obamacare is just not popular with anybody. Jack? I mean, it's it's amazing because these people and I I love when they do these, they show these videos like this or show what when the Obamas were talking about Hillary in 2008 and bashing Mm -hmm. her and everything. And I love when they do this because these people have no core. They have no actual values. They just sort of go with wherever the political liberal wings seem to be going and Mm -hmm. and they'll just say whatever it is. You listen to them one day. They're saying one thing, you listen to him a year later, it's completely different. You can go back to President Bill Clinton when he was president, and he's up there talking like Trump on immigration. Mm -hmm. Well, I just remember, just to recall uh, exactly how Obamacare came to be. We talked to our country formed on taxation without representation. And Obamacare is a sterling example of legislation without representation. I remember back in September of 2009 when a million people marched on Washington, D.C. and to say we do not want this law. And they passed it in the middle of the night without a single Republican vote. Do you guys remember um, Ben Nelson of Nebraska? Do you remember that name? That was the senator that caved, I believe it was on Christmas Eve, and gave into it. And then later the spring, Bart Stupak. Do you remember him? He was a U.S. congressman from Michigan who was the holdout on pro-life concerns, and then he fell, and then the whole thing passes. Uh, They were walking from the uh, Capitol with that gavel, you know, they're going to hammer this thing in against the will of the people. Absolutely dropped the jaw of America. And following that, we had this, the waves, the, the red waves we had, because that, that was in uh, 2010, I believe, the spring of 2010, when it actually became law. And then we had the, uh, the wave, the red wave, at least on the congressional level in 2014. So um, we, gave, we won the House based on Obamacare. We won the Senate based on Obamacare. And Hillary Clinton calls it the greatest accomplishment, their greatest accomplishment. Does anybody remember healthcare.gov? That was a billion dollar website that didn't work. Do you remember anything about that, Jack? What do you remember about Obamacare? So uh, one of my favorite remembrances of Obamacare was when, I forgot the guy's name, but there was one Democrat who in the House, and he wasn't on board with the bill. He was totally not on board. Maybe you remember the name or somebody can comment in the chat. Uh, but he didn't, he didn't want to go with it. He wasn't for Obamacare. His district was totally against it. And he said, we can't do this. And Rahm Emanuel, so he's, he's the mayor of Chicago now. And he, at the time he was the chief of staff to the president. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, this is Rahm dead fish Emanuel. Right. Mm -hmm. And he actually tracked this guy down into the, the house member, uh, shower. It's like the locker room down there, tracks him down, goes into the shower and the story goes, he's jabbing him in the finger 
uh, jabbing him with his finger in the yeah. chest, naked, naked, I guess, in the shower, <laughs> and tell him, you better vote for this bill, or we're going to come after you, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Mm -hmm. And he, he ended up resigning. He ended up resigning over it so he wouldn't have to vote for it. And he came public with the entire story. It was a huge scandal. And then, of course, just as the media does, they immediately buried it and talked about something else. Yeah. Speaking of burying things, we have some awfully short news cycles out there, Jack. We have had, uh, well, over the summer, we had a terrorist attack in Orlando, Florida, where 49 people are gunned down in cold blood. And how long did that news cycle last? About a week? May, maybe a week. Sorry, the I'm person you were trying back. to reach has a voicemail box that has not been set up. I am back on. Jack, can you hear me now? Hang on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, the the Skype. We're having real problems with Skype tonight. So we had Kerry Smith, who was uh, supposed to come on at the beginning. Hopefully, he'll call in in a little bit. And then Jack, you had problems uh, getting Skype to work on your laptop this afternoon. So I have no idea what happened with that. I'm I'm mm. telling you, I think something somebody got to Microsoft, I and mean, we know that Microsoft has donated to Hillary, just like every one of these <laughs> tech companies. And it would not. I mean. They're, they're banning Trump supporters all across Twitter. They're banning Trump pages on Facebook, on and off Facebook. They banned the God Emperor Trump page very publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're just going to keep doing this. So it wouldn't surprise me if they came down to your voice radio and said, we need to stop those people, those rabble rousers with that yeah. show of theirs. I tell you what. Okay, so Jack, before we go on a little further, why don't you tell our listening audience who may not be familiar with you, kind of who you are. How did, how did you get to be Jack? Posovic. <laughs> well, I got to be Jack Posovic by being born, but uh, <laughs> you can blame my mom and dad for that one. But um, so I, I kind of refer to myself as a recovering political operative. Okay. And what I mean by that is uh, I used to be Mr. College Republicans uh, uh, when I was in college. So I was the, the campus chairman for my campus at Temple University in Philadelphia. I'm from uh, from Philadelphia area originally I'm in DC now. And then I became the statewide executive director for Pennsylvania, moved on to doing national things. And from there on, it was an easy slide into working on campaigns for different uh, different races, people running for um, running for Senate, running for governor, running for lieutenant governor, running for Congress, a bunch of races out in Pennsylvania. Actually, at one point, the, uh, the number one hot contested race in, in Pennsylvania, or sorry, in the entire country, uh, it was this one congressional race that I was the field director for, and we and we won by like, I mean like point zero six percent, but but I think about twenty million dollars had been spent on this one congressional seat. What year was that? That was two thousand eight. Okay. So, so and as you remember, uh, you were talking about some of the waves. Two thousand eight was not exactly a good year for Republicans. No. Um, but we were able to get a Republican set, uh, congressman to win. And they, they thought they could spend that money against us and, and mm -hmm. we would lose, um, but but we were able to, to just, you know, just enough be able to get it in there. Right. Um, so I did that for a long time. And to be honest, as I got, I don't know, bigger and bigger uh, opportunities, I kept running into the problems with... Um, some of the stuff that I saw going on at higher levels and some of the people saying, well, Jack, you know, you can't say this and you can't do this. And you, you, mm. you know, that policy or that, that ad that you made was too. Now we were doing stuff and I was doing stuff like, you know, how Trump has the nicknames and all those little like, cute little videos and everything. Mm -hmm. We were doing that. We were doing that six years ago in Pennsylvania um, and running uh, people who weren't people who weren't career politicians, find someone who's a businessman, find someone who's, uh, just been been a community leader. Find someone who's been a veteran and have them run, and and you just find these people in the party. These I guess uh, uh, you know sort of these apparatchiks, and they just didn't want to go for it, and fought us tooth and nail. Which is funny because it's the exact same thing we saw play out with Trump in the primaries. Mm -hmm. So I said, forget all that. Uh, I'm I'm through with this, and I went off and joined the military. Uh, <laughs> 
because I said, you know what, maybe this will be a better way to 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 work with the country and uh, and maybe be able to better serve in a, in a different capacity, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, so tell us just briefly about your time in the service and thank you for it, by the way. But tell oh, us sure. about so, it. Uh, so uh, I served as uh, in naval intelligence. Uh, I was a naval uh, enlisted naval intelligence and then later a naval intelligence officer. Um, deployments to uh, all throughout Asia. Work with the um, work with uh, naval headquarters, naval intelligence headquarters, and a probably probably interesting one. A, a year long deployment at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, so currently, um, uh, currently veteran status. Currently not uh, you know not active duty or anything like that. Mm hmm. That's you've done. A, you've crammed a lot into a lo little bit of time there, Jack. So, and um, where does today find you? What are you doing these days? Because I've seen you on Twitter. Uh, you've got a great account. What about twenty twenty three million? I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> twenty three thousand followers. But you got a fantastic Twitter account. And the first time I think I remember seeing you was uh, during a Periscope. With Mike Cernovich, you guys were outside the debate last Monday night uh, yes. with Trump, the, the presidential debate. So you guys were outside. Tell us a little bit. So tell sure, us how sure. you found, find yourself uh, with Mike Cernovich on Periscope all of a sudden. So, so after, I honestly, I'll tell you in, in like kind of a roundabout way, but I'll make it short. So <clears throat> I, I always said I'm, I would never go back to politics. I never wanted to do that. And I didn't want to work a race anymore. And I, but I always kind of said, unless it was, you know, somebody special. And then Donald Trump ran. <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, I've, I've got to get involved somehow. So yeah. by the point by that point, a lot of the staffing had already taken place for the campaign. Um, but then some people that I knew knew some other people and got me involved with Citizens for Trump. And so okay. I'm in Citizens for Trump now as the National Special Projects Director. Um, OK, so tell us about that and give us the website while you're at it. So. Our it's listeners just citizensfortrump.com, citizensfortrump.com. Okay. And you guys can go there, you can sign up, you can volunteer. We are a grassroots national network that we do so much fun stuff. We do we do sign waves all over the country for Trump. Uh, we do flash mobs for Trump. We go to we go to every rally. We go to you know those pictures that you see from the rallies, a lot of those are from either myself going to a rally and not just Trump rallies, but mm -hmm. Hillary rallies and Bill Clinton rallies. Um, if Black Lives Matter is doing something, we'll go there uh, and, and see what's going on. And we just want to show, and I think that's something that, that the media hasn't really been doing lately, and the fact mm -hmm. that they're not showing what's actually happening in the country. Oh. But because we have the technology now between Periscope and Facebook Live, that mm -hmm. we're able to actually show people the truth of what's going on. And to be honest, I'm actually Facebook Living this right now to the Citizens for Trump Network on Facebook. <laughs> um, so they can That's all awesome. quick shout out to all you guys on Facebook. We've about across the the Facebook network. We've got Okay, now I'm not hearing Jack. I am not hearing.
Hello? Can you hear me? I'm not hearing Jack. I am not hearing Jack. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hang on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, that was so weird. It's so good. I know Skype's being really, really weird tonight. Jack, I know it you didn't said even tell me it disconnected. <laughs> I didn't hear a word of what you said, but I know you were doing a great job of describing citizen journalism. So don't repeat it. The audience, I'm sure, heard it, but I didn't. But anyway, so um, let's take it from here. Uh, we've got you've got something coming up. Uh, some a plan using citizen journalists um we we have a lot of plans we have a lot in the works a whole lot in the works okay tell us a little bit about um the social media strike force so the social media the idea behind social media strike force is one of the things we're partnering with mike cernovich on and the idea is taking the power of the trump social media army you call it the the, the trump train right and and turning that into something that's actually ongoing. So instead of just, instead of, oh, somebody saw an article in the news or, oh, somebody saw like a nice, um, you know, a nice uh, meme and let's repost that. No, 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 we're gonna get rid of that. We're gonna have what, what we like to call the content mindset. The content mindset basically means that we are gonna be creating our own content, our own videos, our own stories, things that we're gonna go out, we're gonna find people and, and we're going to have nationally, like Citizens for Trump has already kind of been doing, whenever there's an event, when there's a debate, when someone's in town, when Bill Clinton's in town, we're going to have somebody go there and we're going to have a find out. We actually actually just had our first success with this the other day uh, when Hillary came to Philadelphia, uh, mm -hmm. just outside of Philadelphia, Haverford, and a bunch of people showed up to get in, even Hillary supporters, Democrats. They weren't allowed in. And everyone's like, what's going on? Why aren't we allowed in? Well, then this bus pulls up and out of the bus walk all these people and the actual people are like, what's going on here? So they took a video of it. Um, uh, Erica Setnik, uh, uh, a good friend of mine who's who's there in, in the county. So they're, they're literally busing people in and these are like actors or something. And then we found out later that one of the one of them was a child actor that, um, you know, asked Hillary Clinton a question. So we totally broke that story to them. Um, and if we hadn't been there, then it would have just been business as usual. Oh, everything is perfect. Look how good we are. Um, so that's that's the power of the social media strike force, and and the I, the power of social media and citizen journalism in general. Mm -hmm. And I and I know you know the ma the most famous one of all was you remember that video, the video of Hillary Clinton falling at the 9/11 memorial, right? Yeah, yes. Who took that video? A, a citizen, but do we even know? It's, I mean, it was a guy with, that, that's the whole point. It was just a guy with a Twitter account. It was, the entire mainstream media was there. Think about this. Fox was there, MSNBC was there, CNN was there, BBC was there, everybody. 
and none of them could turn a camera on Hillary Clinton while she's walking by? What does that even mean? Why, <sighs> why wouldn't they? Why weren't they doing that in the first place? That's kind of what I want to know. So yeah. here's this guy, and he's just standing on the side of the road, like, "Ah, oh, there's Hillary. I'll take a video of her." And then you know he caught what he caught. But to me, the question was, "Oh my God, this guy is actually catching national." One guy with a phone and a Twitter account changed the entire world that day. I think he did too. I think he did too. You know, um, that reminds me a lot of Andrew Breitbart. And I know you know Andrew. We want to hear that story too. But uh, I had a chance uh, to meet him in 2010. He was in the Dallas area making a speech. And he said uh, that it was the beginning of the um, watching uh, people use their smartphones. He says, if you've got one of these, you are the media. And yes. he said he remembered sitting on his back porch one night. He had his laptop and his phone, and he thought, thanks, Steve Jobs, for the weapons. I mean, he was a Mac user, but he just... See, these he, were, he got it. He these got this were the way weapons. ahead of us. Yeah. He got this so far ahead of all of us. And that, you know, it. that's why, you know, we. I mean, if he was still around today, mm-hmm. I don't even think Hillary would be in the race. <laughs> <laughs> I think they would they they would have just taken her down because he understood the main the idea behind content mindset and the idea behind Andrew Breitbart is the same is you create your own content you create your own culture mm-hmm. and that's the difference thing this yeah this is a political race and it's one candidate against another candidate but mm-hmm. it's also a culture shift that's going on right now and yeah, that's and what the that's what we need to get into it's true and it's interesting when you say co- uh, content mindset. I'm always looking either on a tw- when I'm looking at a tw- following a Twitter account, if all that person does is retweet other people's material, I'm not as likely to follow than if they're giving me their thoughts. I want to see somebody write something. I want their take on it. I want to see what they think about a situation. So that content and it's the same thing with um think about some of the blogs you visit and the ones you like to to go down into the comment sections if you do that it's the it's the blogs that have original thinking original reporting it's not just uh linking to uh, whatever the mainstream media is writing about and having a reaction to it i want original content so you're right about that that is definitely something that I think people are hungry for, and I think that's something that people are looking for. Right, because otherwise you're just regurgitating, and and anyone yeah. can do that. And it's and 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 also you're regurgitating the narrative that the media has already set. So they've set the narrative of the story, yeah. and now you're regurgitating that. So even if you're complaining about it, well, or disagreeing with it, well, you already showed it to everybody. So. That's true. You know, it's no, we're, we're going to go out there and now we're breaking stories and now we're set, we are setting the narrative because we're telling, and actually it's kind of funny. So I, I mentioned this to Cernovich as we were walking around at the, uh, you know, at the debate and we're saying like, you know, we talk about how special it is that we're doing this and we're able to do this, but it's just actual journalism. That's all it is. Yeah. It's, and the media won't do it anymore. Part of, the, part of that's because they don't have the money. And part of that is because they're just completely, uh, you know, they think that you can tell an entire story from uh, sitting behind their computer and just writing all day. Yeah, yeah. Well, t- go back to they don't have the money. What's, why don't, why don't they have the money? What's happened there? Is it anything changed or? So their model, their model, their entire business model of how they did media before is completely broken. So it used to be subscription based when it was one of the newspapers mm-hmm. um, or ad based when it was a TV show, a TV network or something. But mm-hmm. we're, look, look where, where are people going today? We're going to social media. Social media information is free. You don't have to subscribe to Twitter. You don't have to subscribe to Facebook. Though mm-hmm. we are hearing that Twitter is now possibly uh, going up for sale. So we'll see about that. Um, but these mainstream media companies are just used to you paying for their stuff a day in and day out. Well, that model is completely broken now by the internet and TV is broken, of course, as well, too. People aren't, mm-hmm. aren't sitting and, and watching TV all day long anymore. I mean, it might yeah. be on in the background at like an office or something like that, or, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. up in the airport, you know, CNN actually pays thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to make the airports play C- play CNN only. They sign these exclusivity contracts because they're desperate. They're just so desperate to be on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and the problem as well is there's so many sources of content now mm-hmm. that for me to say, 
you know, when when the newspapers, their websites tried all those paywalls. You remember those? Oh, yep. well, you want to read the whole article, you've got to pay $5.99. Yeah. Nobody yeah. signed up for that. Mm-hmm. Nobody. And they weren't mm-hmm. going to either because this is the internet and the internet is free. We've had it free for 20 years and you pay a subscription to get, you know, your service and then you get the information for free. And I don't think there's mm-hmm. anybody who's willing to go, unless you're already invested in something like a, pr- a certain program or a certain, you know, personality, you're not going to go. You're not going to go and pay a subscription service just to see, you know, something you don't know about. So their model's broken. They've been having to fire so many people. Um, perfect example I was talking about earlier today was is what's going on in Syria right now. Mm-hmm. You know, CNN made their, you know, really made their name with the Gulf War coverage in the 1990s or yes, the early yeah, 90s, yeah. I guess. Mm-hmm. And and it was it was award winning coverage, and uh, there were some issues with it back in the time. But you look today, and there's they don't have anybody. They don't have anybody over there. And so instead, they get press releases from the Obama administration, and they kind of report on the press releases if that's reporting. Well, who's giving in the press releases from the Obama administration? Is it Where's that originating from? That'll just be press secretaries or a Department okay. of Defense spokesperson, uh, Samantha Power, who's over at the Department of State. And, mm-hmm. and you know, she's just getting a – and I, I, I can't stand to hear her talk because she's, she's the official spokesperson for the Department of State, and she'll go – She'll go and say things like, "Like Russia just needs to stop." Like seriously, like why are they even? Why are they even doing what they're doing? You mean fighting ISIS? I'm pretty sure I know why they're fighting ISIS. <laughs> okay, so this is a total breakdown, then, of what journalism should be. Their original role should be to hold those in power accountable by reporting to the people what those in power are doing. So exactly. if the reporting the is a yeah, and if the reporting is originating from those that are working for those in power, if they're a part of the administration, then they're <laughs> that's just a complete right. total breakdown of so being you're held actually, accountable. You've actually become you know, you've actually become what the Soviet Union used to have, where it's just a government Pravda. <laughs> yeah, Pravda somewhere is setting the narrative and saying, well, this is what we're going to have. And this is this is this is the truth today. And that's what Pravda meant. Truth. Mm-hmm. Right. So. So, yeah, CNN is going to tell the truth today. Here's here's the truth for you. I, I mean, it's it's so Orwellian. It's so 1984. It's it's shocking sometimes how 1984 it is. That's. That's absolutely amazing. Well, we kind of skipped this over, but I want to go back and hear a little bit about your um, relationship with Andrew Breitbart. Did you get to work with him? At some I, point? I did, actually. So it, it, at one of my political gigs at one point, um, I was helping out the the David Horowitz Freedom Center. Mm-hmm. And this would be back uh, probably 2009 through about 2012. Almost. And... And one of David Horowitz's good friends was Andrew Breitbart. And this this is the time when Breitbart.com was just first getting started. And he had, so Breitbart used to work for Drudge. And then he kind of went off yep. to do his own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there'd be times where, you know, you know, stuff on emails and conference calls, but actually got to met, meet him a whole bunch of times. And talking to him was incredible because <laughs> he could have, like, you know, those guys who play chess, and they'll be like the you know they're like great chess player they're they're playing chess on like five different games at the same time I don't know if they're winning all five different games you know I could play five games of chess at the same time too but um, <laughs> he could honestly be holding five different conversations at the same time with himself <laughs> that's how, how I describe him because he'd be he'd be ta- and there's a few videos of him if you find the video of where he spoke at CPAC I want to say it was 2011 you can actually see him doing it is he'll be talking, he'll be talking, and then he'll see somebody and he'll start talking about them. And then his, his phone pops, so he pulls out his Blackberry and he's like talking to that. And then he, mm-hmm. but then he'll jump right back in where he exactly at the point he was at before. Um, and it's funny, so after uh, years later, I actually ran into somebody who went to high school with him, mm-hmm. just completely randomly yeah. uh, in, the mil- in the military, a guy I knew in the military. And I said, you know, was he always like that? And he said, oh my God, he was always like that. That's that. He's like that was Andrew. He was he was just exactly like that. I mean, yeah. he would be thinking on like ten different levels when mm-hmm. you're just like, hey, man, I just want to like go to the prom, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was he was one of a kind. He definitely was, and like you said, ahead of his time as far as what a citizen with a smartphone can do, 
uh, we are the new media, and that has taken off. He said that was six years ago, more, maybe more than that. And here we are. And like you said, a, a, a citizen with a smartphone captured Hillary Clinton collapsing at ground zero on 9-11. That is a game changer. That was a game changing video because so it, it look at, at the polls. So I looked at that LA times tracking poll that yeah. was out. She has not led or even had a significant increase since that day. She has not. So that was kind of the, that really was the turning point then kind of a downhill slide since that point in time. Oh I yeah. Think- you can see it like, you know, it's, it's close and she's up and Trump's up and she's up mm-hmm. and Trump's up. And all of a sudden that happens and it was like, boom. Yeah. This huge spread. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, I think I heard it before Mike even said it, I kind of sensed that Hillary's health was going to be something that was going to be a great way to demoralize her side because it's something that they have no defense for. I mean, they absolutely have no defense for her health. They can argue themselves out of uh, all kinds of corruption and they can say, and they can say, oh, that's just your bias and you know you can twist it and turn it. We're, we've gotten so cynical, even uh, I mean people on both sides can can use criticism as a, oh, you're just you're, you're just on a witch hunt. But when you talk about somebody's health, uh, th- there's just really no good defense on their side about the state of this woman's health. It's really an issue. And it I think it's a demoralizing issue for their side. But it also brings uh, it also makes the vice presidential can uh, can uh, debate that happened on Tuesday night. I it makes it mention that uh, it the, I made the that, other shoe has dropped now because that was the other shoe because if there's your president, if something happens to her. That's right. She is, if she's incapacitated somehow, well, it's not just about uh, Tim Kaine, but we start looking at the other people that Hillary has surrounded herself with. I mean, the VP debate basically said that Trump is great at hiring people. He's great at spotting talent. Mike Pence was a fabulous pick. Hillary's judgment is terrible. This guy was awful. <laughs> I'd like to say uh, Mike Pence was the first hire of the Trump administration. That's true. That's true. And it was and what, a pretty damn good one. And <laughs> what a say. great one. What a great one. Even though there was criticism at first, um, he, it, he once again, Trump was right. But look at Hillary's judgment in hiring Tim Kaine. And then you start wondering, well, what? who else would she put in her cabinet? If she were incapacitated, is if her health is truly an issue, then who would be pulling the strings in a Clinton administration? And then you start looking at her circle and you see people like Huma Abedin in that circle. And that's when you get to Huma Abedin. And, and Citizens for Trump, we have a, a very good relationship with uh, Mr. Roger Stone. And he's done some great work at putting together the research on who exactly Huma Abedin is and the fact that both of her parents are members of the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm. The fact that she she herself was an editor of a Muslim Brotherhood newsletter that uh, said they were pro 9-11. Mm-hmm. And that she re- not only did she uh, edit the paper, but she remained an editor of the paper for, uh, I think, well into the 2000s. All during which the time that she was employed by the Clintons. Mm-hmm. And then if you go back and actually, and just this this is all research that's perfectly available that anyone could do. And you could find that she actually began her internship for Hillary Clinton in the White House when she was first lady at the same time that Monica Lewinsky began her internship with for Bill. So this is someone who's been with Hillary for many, many years. Mm-hmm. I didn't I didn't realize she was an intern with Monica. It's right, because that, not something like that hasn't been reported. You know, she's only now coming to light because there's citizen journalism and because there's research that's getting out through other venues. Mm hmm. <sighs> That's that's astounding. Okay, that's great. Um, so we have Hillary's health as an issue. We have her poor judgment in hiring people around her, well, or good judgment, depending on who, what your goals are. What would you say, other than Hillary's health and Hillary's judgment, do you think is the a detriment to the Clinton campaign success? I, I can I can tell you right now. It's um there there's probably two. Uh, number one is the fact that she has has a terrible record with race relations when it comes to her 
uh, some of her statements in the past on the African American community mm -hmm. and statements that, as much as she won, she's not able to take back. Uh, yeah. She used very strong language. She referred to uh, African Americans as super predators, and mm -hmm. not only that, the language, but the fact that her and her husband, when when she was giving that speech, it was in for, in uh, in support of the crime bill, which carried higher uh, penalties on it for rock cocaine, which at the time was was used predominantly by the African American community. So it was a completely racist policy. And mm -hmm. thousands of people were locked up for these and mandatory minimums as well under the Clintons uh, that absolutely targeted African Americans. I mean, in another era, these would have been referred to as Jim Crow. Um, and so I mm -hmm. think number one, it, and, and, and people are, are coming on to that stuff. People are realizing it. And number two is, is quite clearly, uh, you know, she wants to campaign as as this champion for women, but as we've all seen, she has been anything but. And I know that uh, Juanita is is uh, a co-host here on the show, and mm -hmm. I I personally believe Juanita, as well as many of the others that have been uh, victimized by not only Bill but Bill and Hillary Clinton, uh, Bill for committing these acts and mm -hmm. for for Hillary for actually allowing it to happen and enabling it to happen. Okay, so terrible relationships with. Uh, minority communities, terrible relationships with women. And now we have the admission by Hillary herself that one of her favorite world leaders is Angela, Angela Merkel. My tell us what, goodness. Tell us, Jack, why you think that's a, a, is it a, is that a third shoe to drop? I don't know. What you I mean, call so, that. so this, this gets into Hillary's she wants to talk about her time as Secretary of State and, and what she's done in the world. And the only thing, I mean, look at the state of the world today. Is this, it, does this seem good to you? Does this seem stable? Does this seem like, hey, things are going great, let's stick with this? Mm -mm. Absolutely not. Angela Merkel has completely destabilized her country. She mm -hmm. has completely uh, destroyed any semblance of, of, of having just peace and safety and regular... Uh, the country of France was under uh, was under mar uh, partially martial law. They were under uh, state of emergency procedures for months a after numerous attacks. Uh, Belgium had three terror incidents just yesterday. Uh, Germany has so is having so many more attacks, and that's not only terrorism, but it's the way these uh, a lot of these imported refugees that that Angola sort of forced on the European Union mm -hmm. um, have been treating women, have been treating other minorities, have been treating children, mm -hmm. uh, and, and when it comes down to it, their their culture and their ideas about what is right and what's wrong are vastly different from ours. Yeah. Yeah. And so for her to pick. Angela Merkel. That that honestly has to be one of the like. Just where is the judgment on that one? I mean, say something. You know, she could have said like Netanyahu. She just met him the next the day before. Yeah. Uh, you know, pick someone safe, man. Don't don't, yeah. don't say Angela Merkel. She's going down in flames even in her own country. Yeah, I think she just dropped recently twelve points in the polls. I saw. I mean, just recently. But yeah, what they I, had, what um, they had local like uh, like uh, sort of their version of like congressional races and her party. It was destroyed, yeah. absolutely destroyed. Yeah, destroyed. Well, what I know of Angela Merkel, and I don't pretend to know her motivation for doing this, but I understand they let in around 1.25, 1.5 million refugees in 2015 alone. That's right. And that they had about an 800,000 deficit in workers. Uh, they've got a lot of manufacturing in Germany and that they needed workers and that she saw these uh, men flooding her borders as a new workforce. However, thanks to social media, the word had gotten out that Germany had free money. Free money in Germany, if you can just get to Germany. Uh, and when she told, she actually told companies, you need to hire these people. She told businesses what to do, hire these refugees. But when these companies, some of them tried to hire these refugees, they said, oh, no, we're not, we're not here to work. We're Merkel's guests. We're her guests. So <laughs> she's got a mess, an absolute mess on her hands. And this doesn't even include the way these refugees are treating the women in Germany. They have made a game out of raping anyone with blonde hair. I mean, it is, it's, like a, it's like an extra score to sexually assault a woman with blonde hair. So you have all these blonde German women. And then in Cologne, 
And not just Cologne, they found out this was actually a coordinated attack. It was Denmark, uh, Helsinki, Finland, there were some other cities involved. But at midnight on New Year's Eve, there was yep. a coordinated sexual assault on any woman nearby by a refugee with a smartphone. Go and go now. And I think in Cologne alone, there was a, there were over a thousand complaints right there in that square, right in Cologne alone. In journalism, where, where do you hear any of this in the mainstream media? I didn't hear it in the mainstream media. Anyway. I heard it. I heard it from a citizen journalist. You're, so, you're not hearing it. You're, you'll hear about uh, what was it? Uh, Trump doesn't know how to pronounce Nevada correctly, mm -hmm. but they were trying to say it was some kind of story, mm -hmm. or, or, or talking about some, uh, tweets. Yeah. Some of the most um, bone-chilling video I've seen has come from uh, Facebook posts from overseas and some of some YouTube posts from overseas. So I cannot I cannot get this out of my mind's eye. But there was a woman uh, in Germany, and she was surrounded by about fifty refugee gentlemen, and they they were pulling her down into a, a subway tunnel. And she was screaming. And this is in broad daylight in in the, uh, you know, in the city. And I, I just can't get that. Somebody filmed it. And I can't get it out of my head. Another thing you and I were talking about earlier today was the power of the images of the, the refugees cutting through the uh, agricultural fields somewhere, somewhere in Europe. Just like um, an army. An army of people on foot coming, cutting through um, the fields of Europe. And so you had this, uh, th these images, and one of, I think one of the game-changing videos out there this cycle has been the snake, uh, so, narrated by Donald Trump. And so we, if you go um, to YouTube, and in fact, Bill showed it uh, on Your Voice Radio a few weeks ago, but The Vicious Snake is the title of it, and he is narrating the snake uh, video uh, and he's narrating the, the the lyrics to the song as you see video video. Jack, did your video end, or can you still hear me? Oh, I can. I can hear you fine. Oh, you, you can. can you're, okay, yeah. your video's frozen, but if you get okay, there you are. Okay, oh. so right, so Donald Trump's narration of the snake, along with the vi with the images in that video, I, I tell you, to me as a as a an American, and especially as a woman. I think with women in this country at this point in in, our, in the history of our country, we want protection. I think that's number one on any woman's list, not just protection for ourselves, but protection for our kids. And anyone who says, I'm going to protect our borders, I'm going to put the interest of our country first. Um, th this is what, what this is what I think in, not just women, but any American wants. Um, I, I, I really want to know. I want to know why. I want to know why this this mass importation needs to take place. I, I want to know what what is the actual what do we get out of that? What 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 are we getting for the us the American people by seeing all this going on overseas and saying, oh, that's what we want to bring here. We need we need some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and and you know you can take go down some pretty scary roads thinking about why people might want something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I personally think it's they they just want more voters and they think that if oh will you you know, you gave us free citizenship, then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll always vote for you. I was just following a story up in Canada, though. And I think it's funny that, you know, you only see these people from like, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the conflict in Syria and Iraq or, or Turkey, but there's also a, a civil war going on in Ukraine right now. That's, that's mm -hmm. having a huge humanitarian crisis, but nobody seems to be talking about those refugees. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody seems to be giving these big UN speeches about how we need to help these refugees. And I actually just mm -hmm. saw a story uh, last week, Canada deported a family of Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, be and it was because somebody didn't like fill out a form right like 10 years ago back in the yeah. Ukraine. Oh, nope, sorry, back to the war for you. But yeah. the 25,000 Syrians that we imported, oh yeah, you guys are fine. Yeah, just, just go on, you know, you'll be okay. Yeah, well, I actually think it's a little more sinister than just voters. I think there are some world planners, some people who have a globalist mindset who want to see the world with no borders. Um, I think that they have figured out a way to benefit from that. I don't know who all is involved. Uh, I, there's a few names I know that are involved. But I think a borderless society uh, was the plan, especially was the plan in Europe. The EU was uh, begun because of trade. 
It took them about 40, 40 years to put it in place. But trade is what o- cracked open those borders. They stopped calling them immigrants. They started calling them workers. These people just want to go where the jobs are. But what crashed the idea was a clash of cultures. The cultures of people who practice the faith of Islam. The Sorry, it's not even a f- that practice Islam. And they are not there to assimilate. They are not there to work. They are there to conquer. And the real clash happens when you have Western civilization who cherishes charitable, they they honor charity, a charitable giving. But you have a culture who doesn't, who sees charity as a form of submission and a green light to conquer. So it, it is just a true clash of and I could, I could tell you, having um, having spent a year uh, at Guantanamo Bay, uh, mm-hmm. with up close and personal with uh, with some of the worst of the worst uh, of these guys, mm-hmm. um, they and I, I, my buddy and I always always talk about. We'd love to write a book. Um, this is what Al Qaeda believes, and then the subtitle is because it's what they told us. Mm. And and if you you'd hear some of the things these and the things they believe and the sort of the the lies that that they think the, about the way the world works or about mm-hmm. what they have to, what, what it basically comes down to, I would say is they still think they're, they're still fighting the crusades. Mm. You know, we sort of think of that as like something that happened uh, you know, 1400 years ago. Right. Mm-hmm. They, to mm-hmm. them, it's no, it's yeah. us versus you and we're going to win. Yeah. And I don't know if we're winning at this point. I don't know. It's a, winning. it's a conquer mentality. And I think they, the globalist planners, whoever they are overplayed their hand and they flooded too fast uh, with the northern a- Africans and the Middle East just swar- just swamping. I mean, there's video of Greek islands that have more people landing on the island than live there. I mean, well, just we know for absolutely. A fact that because of some of the leaks that have come out, that George Soros is behind a lot of this. Mm-hmm. We actually mm-hmm. saw in those leaks that he had documents where he was reporting to his organization just how many Somalians they had report they had imported to Europe and how many mm-hmm. Syrians and and mm-hmm. they had goals for the next year of how many they wanted to import and how many they wanted to migrate from one side to the mm-hmm. other and the millions of dollars that he was spending and in putting into this so I mean it, it almost sounds like a plot out of James Bond or something that this shadowy Hungarian billionaire has a has a plan to take over the world but that's what in the headlines and that's what's in the documents and that's what they say. So if you read them and you see what's going on, it's kind of hard to come to any conclusion other than that. It is, it is, it's a mess. And, uh, before we move on, we've got a blue dose take tonight. We've got a short, uh, little, um, word from him. He's on vacation, but before we get there, um, there, this admission from Hillary Clinton that Angela Merkel is one of her favorite world leaders has been, uh, made into a short video, uh, Jack, tell us a little bit about that. I retweeted you just this morning, uh, that video. Tell us about that and what, what is yet to come on that. So, so that video, um, Mike Cernovich put it out with Danger and Play Media. Um, it's, and that's, we talked about content mindset and that's the whole idea. So it's a video that shows Hillary. It's got images of her. It's got images of Angela Merkel. It's got images of these, these refugees and what they're doing to Europe. And what they want to come to here, and it shows it, and it just bears it out, and it's got very some 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 very graphic scenes, I would say, mm-hmm. in it. But it presents it in a way that it explains to you how these are tied together, and that's what she wants for America. Mm-hmm. And so it's really short. Happened. Is it about a minute? It's, oh, it's, yeah, it's about forty-five seconds. About a 40, 45 second, very eye catching, very edgy, lots yeah. of uh, fast moving images. It's very very sharp, and I understand Mike contracted for four more of these. So yeah, four, they're going four or five more, definitely. And these are coming out and, and not just on that topic, but on a lot of topics. And these are mm-hmm. part of uh, this new project that we're starting called MAGA 3X. And it's going to it's it's in the very uh, embryonic stages right now, but it's going to come out very, very soon. It's going to be huge. It's it's centered around mobilizing the social media army that we have, like the task force. And mm-hmm. the reason we call it 3X is t- is for every single one of us. That's a member of the Trump train online to find three people that aren't registered to vote. All right. Mm -hmm. Find three, Mm -hmm. get them registered. And you don't have a lot of time. You've got until October 11th in some states. Um, So less than a week, get them registered. And then on November 8th, actually take them to the polls. If you have to make sure they go out and vote. So it's three. We're just asking for three. Some people ask for 10. We're saying three people, you make them your people 
and you go get them. So that's MAGA 3X. We're going to have that. We're going to have rallies. We're going to be having uh, uh, everything. It's it's going to be incre incredible. And, and the main thing of it is that we're going to show what's mm -hmm. actually going on, and we're going to get people involved through videos like this. That's that's fantastic. So the hashtag is MAGA 3X. Right, like Make America Great Again. So MAGA 3X. Excellent. That's fantastic. Okay, before uh, we get any further, um, Bill, if you're listening, can you clue <laughs> Pluto's take for us? And thank you so much, Bill, for making the show possible tonight, even though you don't feel well. So Pluto's take for tonight. We welcome back Pluto. What do you have for us today, my friend Pluto? Hello, everyone out there in your voice radio land. It's that time of year when old Bluto here takes his annual October vacation. I'll be traveling, vacationing, visiting family, and having fun. And yes, having fun with family, even the never Trumps, is a possibility. And yes, Fluffy Dog is coming along too. So this week's rambling is a short one. Now, I can hear some of you exhaling happy sighs of relief, but don't get too excited. I still have a patented cheesy Bluto message today. Well, not too cheesy. Um, uh, cheesy light. I'm heading off to have my annual family reunion. It, it should be great, right? It just happens to be at the height of one of the most drama-filled elections ever. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And this shouldn't bring drama to my family or any family, for that matter. Elections will come and go. Politics will ebb and flow. But we should never let politics come between family members. Hmm. And uh, hopefully, I will be able to be a good example of that. Please wish me luck. <laughs> Until next time, cheers. Thank you so much, Bluto. That is a message that... Um... Uh, resonates. We all know people who are on different sides of the fence during this political election. And um, when it comes down to it, when the rubber really hits the road, politics, uh, uh, family should trump that. So, you know, Trump is a uniter. He really, really is uh, doing his best to pull together disparate groups. But there will be people uh, who just can't see things his way and they just won't. Um, Mark Twain had a uh, quote a long time ago that it's easier to con people than to convince them they have been conned. And some <laughs> people just will not let go of certain ideas that they have. It's, it's Sometimes it's a matter of uh, pride, but it can part friends. And hopefully, hopefully, uh, Trump will have a victory in November. I'm I'm really thinking he is i'm hopeful that he is Carrie, prayerful that, we prayerful. know that there's going to be a trump landslide i know there's we a trump know landslide. i know happens when you're i that's that's the day november 9th yeah. is the first day that i'm going to start watching mainstream media because i can't wait to turn yeah, on to watch that the, right exactly oh so God. when when trump wins let's be a uniter like he is and let's reach out to the people that didn't vote for trump because they are our fellow American citizens. And for that reason alone, hopefully we can make America one again. We can reach out and um, pull, pull, I, them, I pull them into the big you. American it's, team. <laughs> and it's it's not something that you do just, you know, for like the last 14 days of the election or like like the, mm -hmm. the 88 days coming up to the election or something like that. It's you, you do it all the time. And that's, that's the message that they're not hearing from uh, these little sound bites that they get from the mainstream media they, that when he says, I want, we're going to be one nation, one people under mm -hmm. one flag. Under and one isn't that how we were all raised? It is. It is. And I have my heart, the heart of those that are tuning in and even some that aren't, our heart is to get back to that time when our chest swelled with pride at the mention of our country, to be proud of our country again. Sure. And we could, we could disagree all day long about issues, but you agreed about where you stood on the United States of America. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jack, we're just about out of time. How can people find you on Twitter? So my Twitter account is Jack uh, Posobiec. J-A-C-K-P-O-S-O-B-I-E-C -E is on Twitter. And then on uh, Facebook, you just go to Citizens for Trump, the Citizens for Trump page. Okay, and one more time again about this social media strike 
workforce? Tell tell one more time how they can it's, become involved. It's in guys. Instead of waiting for the next video, instead of waiting for the next meme that's going to be so funny, you make that meme. Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting for the next video of Hillary doing something or being sick, you go out and get that video. You mm -hmm. take that picture. You make that periscope. You do it live. Mm -hmm. That's Ex content mindset. That's content. And if you guys got content, <laughs> tweet me, tweet Jack, tweet Bill, and we will provide a place for other people to see it. This is what Meme this magic is all. Is real. That's Meme right. Magic is real. That's right. That's what this is about. So citizen journalism, if you're listening, you're a citizen journalism journalist too. So, um, well, we're out of time, Jack. Thank you so much. We're sorry we had Skype problems for Carrie and Joey. They wanted to call in and Skype just wouldn't cooperate tonight. Bill, we hope you feel better. Um, thank you again for making the show possible. We miss you.